The unbreakable backbone of any engagement they were called upon to fight in. Fourteenth Legion bore all that their enemies could throw at them, never backing down, never bending, forever resolute. Upon the ashen, radiation-choked surfaces of hundreds of worlds, the grey-clad Astartes of the Fourteenth advanced, an inexorable tide of power armor grinding all who stood before them into the mud. Know then that this is a record of the tactical preferences, organizational structure, and war disposition of the 14th Legion Death Guard. From the outset of the Great Crusade, the Dusk Raiders, being the first cognomen earned by the 14th Legion, displayed a generally balanced approach to the prosecution of warfare, albeit with a marked tendency towards heavy infantry-centric formations and attritional engagements for which they were to become famed. The resolute character of the Legion, born of its foundation in the warrior culture of old Albia, placed a primacy upon endurance and fortitude. The Dusk Raiders often engaged an enemy knowing that the enemy would break long before they would, relying upon the discipline of its Astartes, but also their innate biological resilience to carry the day in environs and circumstances that would kill a mortal soldier in minutes. Special preference was also paid towards self-reliance. Spending far longer without their Primarch than many other legions, the 14th internalized the orphan status this placed upon them, resolving to overcome what others may have seen as a deficiency by equipping their Astartes and their attendant expeditionary fleets as well and thoroughly as possible. Elements of the 14th were incredibly self-sufficient and could operate for extended periods without any resupply and reinforcements for far longer than any of their fellows in the Legion as Astartes, often indeed in circumstances of extreme privation. Should his bolter run out of ammunition, the Dusk Raider would think nothing of simply laying into the enemy with his gladius for as long as it was deemed necessary, with no expectation of resupply before the battle was won. This attitude became more marked over time, with the 14th preference for infantry-based operations becoming the fulcrum around which their operational strength revolved. Fire support was far more commonly derived from heavily armed support weapon specialists as opposed to tanks or aircraft, and an enemy line was more often than not broken by massed formations of Terminator-armed Astartes supported by dreadnoughts, as opposed to the armored vehicles spearhead assaults, many favored in other legions. That this became a marked trend within the legion pleased the Primarch Mortarion upon his assumption of legion command, for this too was the way of his feral homeworld of Barbarus. Mortarion had defeated the psychic warlords who controlled his planet not with armor or technology, but with the sheer stubbornness of his foot soldiers, and saw within his new Death Guard, the perfect opportunity to create an army of infantry unparalleled by any in the Imperium. Members of the rechristened 14th were now expected to build upon the foundation laid by the Dusk Raiders, to become the ultimate foot soldier, capable of annihilating the foe through sheer implacable aggression and relentless application of force. To this end, Mortarion expanded the role of a Death Guard Astartes to encompass all aspects of infantry-centric warfare. Whereas a legionary from the 13th Legion Ultramarines would steadily advance from, for example, a tactical Astartes to special weapon support to heavy weapon support through years of experience, 
one of the Death Guard would hold all of these positions effectively simultaneously, able to fulfill any and all should the exigencies of the campaign require it. Squad formations were thus remarkably fluid within the 14th, as a tactical Astartes may find himself fighting with a bolter in one battle, then part of a Valkite weapon support squad in the next, should it be required. Only truly specialized roles, such as that of tech marines, were exempt from this expectation. Special note should be accorded to the fact that, even before the Edict of Nikia was passed, the 14th had its Librarius forcibly shut by a ruling of the Primarch. Despite what was widely considered the benefits of employing psychically adept Astartes at the time, especially in an infantry-focused Death Guard, Mortarion's hatred for sorcery, born of his upbringing on Barbarus, brooked no argument, and the 14th Legion librarians were ordered to cease using their powers and return to their positions in the line. The weaponry, born by the Astartes of the 14th, was thus kept as simple as possible, with marked preference for Melta, Flamer, and Bolter displayed above all others. The Death Guard was expected to be able to conquer any enemy with this trinity of war gear, and more specialized firearms were only deployed when the situation called for it. Additionally, the Legion clove to power armor marks that could be most readily repaired by either their warriors or the Legion's tech marines. This had the effect of ensuring the 14th Legion's supply lines were incredibly easy to maintain, as almost their entire panoply of war could be manufactured upon the most basic of forge worlds with the most basic of material stock. It was, in its own way, an outward manifestation of the Legion's core ethos, that the Astartes himself was the greatest weapon ever created, and that he needed only the most basic of tools to bring destruction to the tyrants that opposed mankind's destiny. The 14th did, of course, retain a stock of field armor, aircraft, and support vehicles, as the Death Lord could not countenance his legion being left simply wanting if such machines were absolutely necessary. But none were given any sort of primacy within the Legion's tactical doctrine, and were merely seen as tools of necessity that would allow the infantry to complete their stated role. Perhaps the one exception to this rule was the higher-than-average presence of tanks whose weaponry allowed them to utilize special munitions, such as phosphex or chemical shells. These included Vindicator siege tanks, modified and utilized by the Death Guard in saturation bombardments of enemy positions prior to an infantry advance. Spartan super-heavy transports were likewise kept in high numbers in order to allow mass deployments of Terminator squads to critical battlefield positions. It is noteworthy that, as of the Istvan atrocity, the majority of the Legion's vehicle crews were formed of skilled Terran-born Astartes of the old Dusk Raiders, as during this iteration the Legion had placed much more stock on combined arms warfare. As the years of the Crusade advanced, the Death Guard, under the sepulchral gaze of Mortarion, only hardened in their prosecution of warfare. Whereas the Dusk Raiders were known to be honorable as Darties, willing to accept the surrender of an enemy, the Death Guard were not so kind. A predilection emerged amongst the Legion for annihilation operations, where once they had been willing to accept that when a foe had laid down their arms, they would be welcomed into the body of the Imperium. They now all too often took any sign of defiance as an invitation to extermination. To do so, and in keeping with the Legion's stated preference for line infantry, the Death Guard steadily began to employ deadlier and deadlier munitions and man-portable weaponry into their armory. Radiological weapons, for example, were given favor, as were chemical rounds that could turn organic matter into a sludgy pulp. Viral weaponry 
that could devour the inhabitants of cities within hours, and, worse yet, Phosphex munitions. The crawling death. A fire that could eat through armor like paper and never be extinguished. Employment of such weaponry would often leave a planet's ecosystem irrecoverably damaged, or indeed utterly uninhabitable by baseline human colonists that followed the Death Guard in the Great Crusade's wake, drawing the Legion criticism from numerous Imperial bodies for what, that was, for what was deemed a senseless waste of previously inhabitable worlds. The Primarch Vulcan of the 18th Legion Salamanders was Mortarion's most vocal critic in this manner. Flames of the 18th would turn a planet to ash, undoubtedly, but from that ash, crops would still grow. The Death Guard, he alleged, left behind them only radiation-soaked wastelands, unfit for anyone to even stand in. The Death Lord was known to be derisive of such comments, merely pointing to the effectiveness of his legion and its methods, and how there was no trace of the tyrant he had deposed or the Xeno species he had exterminated. The efficacy of the Legion was never in doubt, but as the years progressed, some within the Imperium began to wonder that the sheer cost their victory would entail. This tendency can be seen writ large in the unique formation within the Legion, the aptly named Grave Wardens. These Terminator-armored elite Astartes bestrode the battlefield arrayed in grenade-launching weaponry and stocked with the most potent biological munitions the Legion stocked, including Phosphex, the flesh-devouring Vastogox virus, and incredibly lethal cull gene gas. Originally only under the purview of First Captain Callus Typhon's First Grand Company, the Grave Warden's effectiveness in this new style of 14th Legion warfare saw their remit expanded to serve all great companies within the Legion. The chain of command within the Legion was rigid and expected to be obeyed with total compliance. Owing to the predilection for massed infantry formations, the 14th was split between just seven grand companies, analogous to the chapter, perhaps, but containing within far more Astartes each than the strictures of the Officio Militaris suggested. Few ranks existed, for, ever ones to favor directness, the Death Guard placed primacy upon a clear and blunt chain of command, while they, like their fellows, accorded the captain of the first great company a higher rank than all other of his comrades, the second and seventh great companies similarly ranked. All three had no actual seniority over each other, but the latter two were accorded the titles of commander and battle captain respectively. Obedience to one's superior was both expected and given without question. And there was markedly little rancor or descent down the chain. When an officer died, he was immediately succeeded by his next in line, and this was accepted by all under his purview as the natural order of things. And conduct proceeded without the jockeying for position that occurred within the Sixth Legion Space Wolves, or the political scheming extant in the Third Legion Emperor's Children. This further contributed to the Death Guard's resilience on the field of battle, as the loss of an officer rarely precipitated a loss in operational efficiency or efficacy. Unlike many of their fellow legions, who operated across a diverse range of theatres during the Crusade, Mortarion was ill-disposed to subdivision, and preferred to keep his legion in a coherent and united force, as often as possible. Accordingly, when the legion gathered at Istvan at the behest of Horus Lupercal, it did so in its almost full strength, of approximately 95,000 Astartes. Proportional casualty rates, inflated by the Death Guard's focus on attritional infantry warfare, were estimated to be surpassed only by the 4th Legion Iron Warriors and 12th Legion World Eaters, and were amplified by Mortarion's insistence 
on only using the inhabitants of his homeworld of Barbarus as recruits. While the stock of his poison-choked planet were better than average at surviving Astarte's conversion, they were never numerous enough to keep the Legion in full supply. As such, rendering the 14th in the lower tier of legions, numerically speaking. Their fleet strength, however, was nonetheless impressive, approximately numbering 70 capital ships and three times that number in cruisers and frigates. The legion's slow recruitment and notable casualty rates had additionally served to preserve a staunch Terran minority within the 14th, who would, tragically, find their disquiet the direction their legion was taking, realized in the most horrible of fashions. That is, as is so often the case with one's records, a tragedy for another day. Until then, Ave Imperator, Gloria in Excelsis Terra. This video and this channel are made possible through the incredibly kind contributions of my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com forward slash Oculus Imperia. And if you're looking to keep in touch with the channel, get regular updates, you can follow me on Twitter at ButtStuffKaiju, or check us out on Discord. A link will be in the description and on the channel page.